start the recording now. And uh, yeah, I guess I guess we can start. Um, Maria, do you mind sharing the the your screen? Okay, so what we're going to speak in this session, as uh, I don't know how many of you have been in the introduction of this, maybe some of you haven't, so I will repeat a little bit. We are both representative of the Smart City Research Group at the University of Stavanger. Uh, Maria Korko, my colleague who will also present today, and me, Todor Kesarowski, we are PhD research fellows at the university, and uh, today we are going to uh, give you some indication about our research framework. We are not that advanced in our research, so we will not speak too much about the results, but more about our framework and how we are intending to tackle the issues that we are going to work with. Uh, and the structure of this session will be, we will give you a brief introduction of each of us about our uh, research frameworks. And then we'll have a little break with a few polls questions that uh, we'll be happy if you participate and uh, um, fill up and we'll open for a discussion in the end of the session. I would like to encourage you to type whenever uh, you have something in mind as a question, just type it in the chat, we'll address it uh, in the end though. So without further ado, I'll invite Maria to start uh, with her uh, research framework. Go ahead, Maria. We don't, we don't hear you. No. <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe on the mic. Now you can hear me. Excellent. Excellent. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Todor, for the introduction. Uh, hello to everyone. Um, so my, I'm going to present my project, uh, which is about green infrastructure uh, and especially multifunctionality. And I will uh, give a brief uh, outline about smart cities and how they relate with green infrastructure. So uh, some info about me. I'm a research fellow and PhD student in the University of Stavanger at the Urban Planning Group. Uh, I have obtained my integrated master from the Department of Spatial Planning and Development Engineering from Greece. So my project aims to develop a new model for multifunctionality of green infrastructure in order to achieve sustainable and livable cities. Also, I'm a member of the Smart City Research Network of the University of Stavanger. So I have outlined my presentation in six main parts. First, I will uh, give uh, an introduction on the topic. In the second uh, session, I will go through the concept of green infrastructure. Then I will talk about nature-based solution sustainability. In the fourth uh, session, it will be more about uh, my specific topic, which is the multifunctionality of green infrastructure. Then in the, in the fifth session, I will talk about the, how they relate to green infrastructure and smart cities. And then at the end, I will uh, say some final keynote from the presentation. So let's go to the introduction. So as we already know, uh, cities deal with uh, two major challenges. Uh, one, that, one challenge is the climate change, where we have a major impact in the cities, floods, uh, droughts, uh, the, the sea level rise. 
And the second is the rapid urbanization where we have a shift uh, from the rural areas to the cities. So we can see that 54% of the total population lives in urban areas in 2015. And in Europe, 80% lives in urban areas. So the adaptation to climate change is a huge future challenge for the cities. Due to the fact that all cities, municipalities, and stakeholders have put uh, the, the adaptation to climate change as a first priority in their agenda. So now we can see uh, lots of projects on how to tackle the climate change in cities. So there is a demand and need to increase and preserve the green elements in cities. Consequently, green infrastructures are one tool that helps reduce the effects of climate change and enhance the urban resilience, sustainability, and livability in cities. So many researchers have um, concluded that uh, green infrastructure is an effective solution to global changes, challenges, and it can help cities become more resilient and sustainable. So now I, I will go into the concept of green infrastructure and how we and how it was first introduced. So the concept of green infrastructure is not new, but the last decade have gained uh, extensive attention from the scientists and researchers across the world. So we see for the, the first time in the 1990s, uh, the, uh, the term green infrastructure to appear in the United States and in Europe. But the first time that uh, was appeared in the EU was in 2019 in the Commission White Paper Adapting to Climate Change. So as I told you earlier, the last decade has uh, gained extensive attention, but also we have a, a rich body of research in the topic of green infrastructure, not only in the field of science of urban planning, but also from other area specialization. And also there is an increase in the research in there about the multifunctionality of green infrastructure. So, there are five principles of green infrastructure planning. One is the multifunctionality, connectivity, quality, integration, and last, the social inclusion. Now I'm going into detail about each of these principles. So multifunctionality. It's about to deliver and enhance multiple functions and services. An example is the Tunnel Springs in Portland City Park, which is collect and clean storm water. It's a space for recreation, and a woodland species habitat. The next uh, principle is the connectivity, where we need to create green space networks. So an example is the Isa River in Munich, Germany, which is an ecological and green corridor. The third uh, principle is the quality, where it's uh, about the green space quality. Then we have the integration, which is about the combined green and gray infrastructure, and the characteristic paradigm is the green railways corridor. And then the fifth and last principle is the social inclusion, where we have collaborative and participatory planning. And now we have the community garden. So now let's uh, go into what is the nature-based solution and sustainability. So another major topic in the EU agenda the last year is the nature-based solution. And green infrastructure is one of the nature-based solution. So you're wondering what is nature-based solution? There are actions that are inspired by nature in order to address environmental, societal, and economic challenges in sustainable ways. So in as already know, in 1987, the United Nations Brooklyn Commission defined the term sustainability as that is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. So now in the third, um, in the fourth session, I'm going to talk about uh, the multifunctional green infrastructure, which is the main, uh, my main specific topic in my PhD project. So multi some facts about uh, multifunctionality. So multifunctionality delivers and has multiple functions and services. It provides socio-cultural, socio ecological, and economic benefits simultaneously. UGI uh, Ember and Green Infrastructure Planning combining different, factor, different uh, functions to enhance the capacity of green space to deliver multiple benefits. 
And then the most important thing is that the benefits of multifunctionality should be considered in relation to who needs them and who has access to them. So in order to understand uh, how we can see multifunctionality in the physical green infrastructure, a very good example is the green roofs. So you can see how it looks from the picture in the right side. So what is the green roof, uh, the multifunctionality of green roof? So they, they contribute to reduce storm water runoff and the pollutant load of the water. They decrease the urban heat effect. They improve the insulation of the building and they provide habitat for a variety of species. So after all of that, there are some major points about multifunctionality. So multifunctionality is difficult to assess it and its function tend to require different form of measure and indicators. And also when we consider multifunctionality, we can see it in relation with a spatial assessment of green space function at various scales. So now in the fifth session part, I'm going to talk about uh, green infrastructure in the context of smart city. So have you ever mentioned what is the relation between green infrastructure and smart city? So there are six key areas that smart city progress is evaluated. First, the energy efficient and environmental sustainability. Second, the transport and mobility. Third, the participation in city governments. Fourth, people. Fifth, buildings. And the sixth, the last key area is the city economic, economics. So the concept of smart city is to create level and resilient cities combining the use of technology, infrastructure, and public participation in city life. So how we can see the relation between green infrastructure and smart cities? So cities can apply the so-called ecosystem-based adaptation measures, which make use of green and blue infrastructure. Green roofs and facades are one of those measures that can be installed in new and existing buildings. And also the green and blue infrastructure is relevant additional to the smart city concept. So now I'm going to introduce some of the current application of smart city trends and technology, specifically in urban forest and green space management. So first we have the augmented reality and the virtual reality. So the augmented reality is um, where the real environment is enhanced with computer generated virtual objects often for visualization purposes. And the virtual reality is a simulated experience that can be similar or completely different from the real world. So these are the trends and the concept in smart cities. So the tools that they use in this trend is uh, the mobile applications are the artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and the geographic information system. The second concept and trend is uh, open data, big data, and analytics. So the tools that they use are cloud storage and computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, data mining, and wireless sensor networks. The third concept is the robotics automation and cybernetics. So the tools that they are using as the cloud storage and computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, and cybernetics. The fourth concept is an alternative smart green infrastructure, and the tools are, again, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and then data logger and sensors. The fifth is about the public-private partnership concept and they use the, the tool of innovation public spaces. Then another concept and trend is the mobile and citizen science. So the tools are the mobile applications, is the volunteer 
the volunteer geographic information and crowd searching, which is the VGI, is the harnessing of tools to create, assemble, and disseminate geographic data provided voluntarily by individual. So they allow people to have a more active role in activities such as urban planning and mapping. Then we have the wearable technologies and the blockchain, the blockchain for data security information sharing and storage. The last uh, concept and trend is integrated public consultation and participatory governance. So the tools that they, uh, that they use is the machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning, geographic information system, augmented reality, mobile applications, wearable technologies, blockchain for data security information sharing and storage, social media, platforms, and then the cloud storage and computing. So now we are heading into the end of this presentation and I'm going to talk about, uh, to give a summary on, on some important messages that I want to give after this presentation. So the hypothesis that I am working on my PhD project is if the multifunctionality of uh, green infrastructure will be achieved through the development of a new model method using geospatial and statistical data, then sustainability and livability in cities will be promoted and municipalities will benefit implementing this model. So my research contribution will be, I will create a new innovative methodology on GI multifunctionality using geospatial data, satellite images, big data, and new ICTS. So this model will be developed and tested in Stavanger in Norway. And I will also explore and study the spatial analysis of green infrastructure, multi, multi, of multifunctionality of green infrastructure. So my conclusion here, uh, the, the urban challenges of climate change and urbanization have generally contributed to the rise of the concept of green infrastructure as an effective and helpful tool to address those challenges. So the multifunctionality of green infrastructure is an emerging topic the last years, and still there are some missing gaps that have to be covered. So uh, green infrastructure is also a crucial mechanism in order to achieve sustainable cities. And a last key note is that um, it is important to examine the use of digital and computing technology for green infrastructure. So thank you very much for your attention. And Todor will continue with his presentation. Thank you, Thank Maria. You, Maria. For the talk. Uh, yeah, I would like you to assist me oh, with the clicking, or you want me to share my screen? What do you prefer? Yeah, better share the screen. So uh, uh, I stop sharing my screen. Uh, okay, well, okay, well um, um, so I, I will, I have to skip, have to skip us to, us to, can you, can, can you, you, can you, can you, can you mute yourself? Yes. Hello. Okay. So, uh, the, in the second part of this talk, uh, I will speak about my research project and outline uh, the framework for it. It is about smarter densification for sustainable cities and understanding optimal urban densities. By optimal here uh, and how I frame this is, as, I, as you can take it from the dictionary, basically seeking for the best possible and most efficient way of uh, dealing with it. And I mean, in the course of the presentation, you will learn more about, I mean, because there is a very important disclaimer between density and densification. Anyhow, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm obviously a research, uh, PhD research fellow at the University of Stavanger, Smart City Group. Uh, but uh, I, of course, I've uh, formed my background uh, in a lot of different places, a background in strategic planning and design, GIS-based research and participatory planning. 
Uh, and as you can see, I mean, I have been uh, developing this profile in uh, a lot of different places around the world. And what is even more importantly to say, I guess, is that I have done so in public, private and civil sectors. Uh, and on the soft side of things, I'm a 32 year old Bulgarian uh, living in Norway, married to a Mexican and uh, well, uh, and I'm a champion in rugby of Norway. So <laughs> why I'm saying this, it's uh, except the last thing, the last thing was purely bragging. Uh, I'm saying this because I'm from the story of my life, I became aware that things are, uh, the things are looking from the perspective, from different perspective, they look differently. And uh, that's obviously something that, uh, that it's very hard to tackle with, but I still would like to keep this po the positivist positivism uh, ideology of science and feel that still we have uh, one reality and, and many interpretations of reality, and these are two different things. So uh, if you remember a few things from my presentation, I would like you to make it as clear as possible uh, about three particular things that really uh, frame my strategic, uh, my research framework. So point, highlight number one, this research project, my research project is about understanding optimal urban densities. Why this is important? Uh, first of all, urban density has become a central concept in modern urban planning uh, for, uh, since modern urban planning actually uh, has been shaped through industrialization, actually overcrowding and uh, certain aspects of density were central in shaping modern urban planning. Uh, in the course of development, densities were used as an embedded as a major point in grand visions for urban and regional developments. It has been used as narratives to facilitate new technologies, quality of life and modern mindsets. And of course, also has been used to advocate specific urban technologies and again, quality of life. The thing is, with all of these examples that some of them you obviously know, uh, although it's very hard to speak against Jane Jacobs, but all of these examples, they were taking a very uh, specific perspective tower density, and I would even say a little bit simplified. So looking at one particular element of uh, density and then try to uh, bring causalities uh, around things like quality of life, which is basically very challenging. So what happened that this actually uh, kind of destroyed the concept of urban density at some point that it's not plausible. However, this happened uh, here to the right uh, and uh, the research of Newman that uh, uh, drew this correlation between uh, the density of people per hectare, per acre, and the uh, annual use per capita of gasoline for transportation. Uh, and this tremendous, uh, like, result, uh, that tremendously famous result came into play. And uh, this was aligned with the whole idea of sustainability. So obviously urban density was on the table again, and it was very important part of how we deal with efficiency, sustainability, and optimal use of resources. So this brought us, of course, in the last decades about the debate uh, about densities in a way that uh, what is more sustainable, compact, yes, compact densities or disper the dispersity, the compact city, and so on. And there are many points of looking at this, and, uh, but this is not really the focus of what I would like to achieve with my research, because this is an endless debate and that is very hard to uh, defend with certain amount of cer cer uh, certainty, with clear amount of certainty about what is better. So I rather would like to focus on a few things here when we speak about densities. Uh, there are two general misconceptions about density that are very popular. The first one is urban density by themselves do not tell us anything about quality of life, uh, sustainability, overcrowding, uh, even like COVID spread that is very popular today. Uh, it draws assumptions, doesn't uh, relate directly and doesn't give causalities. And what is even more, uh, it could be even misleading when we speak about urban form. Uh, to illustrate this, again, these are famous drawings that you might know, but this shows the, the, the exact 
exact same amount of build form, the exact same amount of dwellings per hectare uh, within the exact uh, same amount of uh, space. And you can see that the way they are organized, these shapes completely different urban environment and it shapes probably completely different uh, functionality and uh, uh, quality of life or whatsoever. So be mind mindful about that. The second popular misconception about density is that density and densification are the same thing. Well, they're not. Density is really, is a state of things. So it's about, it doesn't suggest any transformation. It just, it just uh, suggests certain aspects of something and it's universally defined. Uh, 100 percent, uh, 100 uh, people per hectare is 100 people per hectare in Norway and 100 people per hectare in uh, Chile. It doesn't make any difference. However, densification is a process and it suggests a transformation and it is extremely contextually dependent. How much you densify, what is actually considered densification, what is considered uh, reducing densities and so on. So that said, I mean, they're internally related, but they're different. And this is very important to be considered. They have different relationship with sustainability as well, but I don't want to ever emphasize on that. However, the point is here that in order to understand densities, we really need to work about multivariable and holistic framework. And this brings me to a second highlight that if you don't remember anything, second point. So this research, project looks at urban densities as a concept to measure performance. What, does it mean? what I, do I mean by this? Well, density, uh, it, it has been a measure for very long time. Uh, and uh, like you here, you can on this slide, you can see many uh, measurements that uh, to which density has been estimated. Some of them has established themselves in uh, building ordinances, some of them not. Truth is, there are more measurements that have been developed. So there are unlimited amount of things and uh, unlimited amount of ways to measure densities. So we have to be aware of that. And not only this, we have to be aware how they correlate with each other. So how uh, measuring the densities of built environment correlate with density of functionality and correlate with density of populations and so on. Uh, there is, uh, this is just a draft. It's not, it's not 100% uh, I mean, it doesn't include all the measurements, but that's rather impossible. The point here is that we have to look at them and relate to each other, like relate each measurement with another one because it's complicated. <laughs> but that said, we can actually break down the things. So if we look at some of the indicators of density are very, uh, like it incorporates a lot of variables. Some of them are incorporating only two of them but in the end of the day everything is based on some basic variables that we have out there in space in, like in cities and this uh, this could be for example building footprints heights uh, open spaces and so on so if we deconstruct everything around density we actually can bring it down to certain uh, things that we have data about and today we we can correlate this data as like as never before because in the end of the day, uh, even if it's complex to use, even if it's complex to grasp all of the relationships that density uh, have in its concept, in the end of the day, it, it is about quantifying concentrations. That's in the definition of density. It's, it's the certain amount of things within certain amount of space. That's in planning, that's in biology, that's in chemistry. This is what I call absolute density. And density has that as a concept. Urban density also is expressed in certain forms. Uh, in, uh, it is expressed in space when we speak about urban planning. So it has shape, like something that I call shape of density. These two things are easier to grasp uh, parametrically. However, there is a third aspect that is urban density is also experienced differently. So there are perceptions of densities. All of these are bound in the context. So they're influenced by each other. Uh, and in my research, I would rather focus on the first two because I feel them less problematic to be uh, specific about and maybe the tools that I have will help. Still, I don't disregard the perception of density. So to illustrate uh, what I'm thinking about is that if you put all of this together uh, and relate them to certain, certain, certain uh, services and amenities, we can actually state things about densities uh, that are more, if, uh, that are more uh, how to say, well-established, positivistic things. 
So if we, if we look at all of these densities, uh, all of these ways to measure densities, and uh, if we consider them, all of them, uh, when we're modeling the city, and on the other hand, we relate to uh, urban physics of the city uh, or uh, the urban planning of the services uh, or certain perception, we actually can correlate and we can draw conclusions. So to take an example, the public transport, we can certainly evaluate the connectivity of the network uh, that is established. We can also uh, ana analyze the intensity and the capacity of the services and how much they cost to be maintained. And we can actually see the actual traffic passenger traffic. So if we correlate this with all of the measurements, we will start having, uh, in particular context, of course, we will start having uh, um, the notions that certain density measurements are more correlated with this service. And then we can identify it for which density measurements actually it works better. Because realistically, if we want to be more sustainable, we are not going to build new, like, like at least in Europe, we're not building new cities. We have to adjust the services. So with that kind of logic, I hope you managed to follow me. Uh, it's, uh, we can imagine that then we can overlay uh, different layers of services and their correlation with densities. And then based on the concentrations and shapes of densities, we can, and the efficiency of urban services, we can actually uh, figure out the threshold of optimal urban densities, which I'm trying to figure out in the end. Uh, that it's not too high, not too low, uh, so not too low to, to be maintained inefficiently and not too high to create a uh, bad service. And of course, the third point that you have to make that I frames my research is that this research project focuses on the largest metropolitan regions uh, in Norway. Uh, that said, uh, it doesn't mean that I'm not, uh, I'm still willing to collaborate, of course, with people outside Norway, but the point is that I really need to to, I really uh, intend to de develop my research in Norway for two major reasons. First of all, I'm based here. And, se and second of all, it is a very interesting context to deal with actually, because uh, densification strategies have been established here for quite some time now, 1987, and they have been developed uh, consistently. And 82% of the population in Norway live in urban settlements uh, based on the data of Statistics Bureau. However, these urban settlements are, have very high degree of, uh, like they have, they have various degree of compactness. And this is especially true for the biggest, uh, for the largest metropolitan and functional areas of, of, the, of the country where more people are concentrated. So the, the cores of the city are much more denser than the outskirts. And uh, in a country like this, uh, that makes it interesting to look at um, because also uh, we have some proof that these densification strategies of course bring some uh, increase achieve the goals of increasing densities uh, but still a lot of them are uh, processed with uh, with because it's it's hard to grasp all of the aspects of density is processed with certain amount of, of inefficiencies and that comes to the fact that, of course, Norway, it's a, it's a rather rich country. So they, these services and this market inefficiency could be uh, compromised either by individual expenses or by uh, public expenses. And that's something that obviously we have to overcome in order to be more efficient. So the three takeaways that I would like you, I hope I give to you, is that through my research, I have the ambition to, to contribute to a holistic uh, understanding of density and as a measurement method, and to strengthen the relationship between density, building typologies, functions, and urban performances. So cost and efficiency to provide services. In that line of thought, of course, I have to make it, uh, to state it very bold that I'm looking at services uh, that I would like to evaluate and correlate with density. So whoever is based in Norway and is listening to this, feel free to contact me. And the third uh, aspect that I would like to still don't disregard is that the perceptual dimension of urban density is still there and it has to be explored. Uh, and I'm willing to collaborate with people to do that. So that's all of me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope uh, I didn't lost you along the way. 
uh, in the next uh, in the next two three minutes i don't know i have to look at the chat if we had certain uh questions i think we are not that many people so you can actually feel feel free to directly uh unmute yourself and speak but first i would like to give like just two three minutes of a break for everybody to stretch or to grab your coffee and to maybe think about your questions and we come back for the uh for the last part of the session um in the meantime i also <laughs> uh, let me see how i can do that i also activate a poll that while we're in break everybody can feel free to fill up will be very great okay see you in two minutes uh and we'll continue with this discussion thank you We haven't been, Maria, we have, a, we were not prepared with some lobby music <laughs> for people. Uh, I see that the poll is running now for three minutes and a half. We have few answers. Uh, we'll give it until five minutes. Uh, and uh, we'll share the results. In the meantime, obviously, 
I mean, uh, you can uh, type the question or just raise your hand. I think this could even work better uh, in a small group like this. So just raise your hand and speak up. Thirty more seconds. All right, uh, so I will share the poll now. Um, I I hope you'll see the result. Like Maria, you, you see the results now, right? Yeah, okay. I see the results. So we collectively, five people answered. So we collectively, uh, we agree that urban density are important <laughs> all around. Uh, that's good. Uh, we agree that climate change is a threat uh, for green infrastructure and uh, yes, we are compact city believers, uh, most of us, apparently. And uh, all right, well, what functionality it is apparently because all of the functions are important. That's a good one. Do you think that, okay, well, exactly, it's exactly the popular belief that we're not sure. That's why we have to work on this to make it clear. And multifunctionality all the way, Maria, that's for you. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we, have we have some questions. Yes, if you want, uh, so the first question is for you, Maria. Yeah. Uh, could you tell a bit more about the green infrastructure. I'm curious to the green infrastructure. Can you tell me about this particular situation? Maybe, I mean, uh, you, you also, yeah, I think it's you. Do you want to elaborate on this just to unmute yourself and? Uh, I, I will. Is it clear for you, Maria? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so then you can just answer. So. I select uh, Stavanger as a case study to, to see the multifunctionality of green infrastructure because there is um, lots of green spaces here. So half of the city is green. And so we want to see if uh, all these green spaces are multifunctional and if they are. So I'm going to, to use the data that I that I told you before, geospatial data, uh, satellite images and big data in order to see if the green spaces here in Stavanger, they are, um, they, they are multifunctional. So I'm going to find some indicators to assess that. Now I'm in the preliminary phase, so I haven't um, I have a clear or uh, outline from the from, um, of the framework of how to go because I have um, started seven months ago my project. So until now, uh, this is my contribution on how we select Stavanger. I hope that I will answer the question. Uh... Yes, I hope you see the results now um, because it was written there. Yes, okay. Uh, yours, I will answer you as well. So the question is like uh, which one of the measurements I would like to focus on in the next step of my research. Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, they're endless, uh, and that, that makes it very difficult to, to actually define um which one to look at i mean through my research work i actually my my ambition is to the data to show it to me 
so not me to make the selection. So let's say, okay, first thing, practical. I will be able to do as much data measurements as the data allows me on big scale. Uh, so everything that I get a hand on and that I develop as data, I will try to visualize in some kind of density measurement. So each neighborhood will have, like let's say, network profile, network density profile, uh, built environmental profile, social demographic profile of density, and uh, all of these profiles are built upon. And the individual measurements I'll correlate. I'll start from from the from the service. So then every service will be evaluated, and then based on the accessibility of this service with respect to a neighborhood. I will see whether there is a correlation between, okay, it's well served, the neighborhoods with uh, that amount of population density, it's well uh, serviced. Or the, the, let's say the, the, the neighborhoods with that amount of open spaces are well serviced in respect to that, uh, and so on. So then based on this correlation, I will see whether like through regression models, I have certain correlations in respect to public transport. I mean, Let's say that this is a bit one of those that is researched the most, so we can imagine that public density definitely will have certain correlation in terms of efficiency. Uh, so basically, the idea is will be okay. We have the profiles of the neighborhoods, we have the services, we evaluate the services, and then we relate it to the neighborhoods. And then when when we run all of this uh, with all of the different measurements, we will have we will be able to see uh which ones are more important because you're right i mean in general some things and some specifics uh will be highlighted by different services uh and that's normal i don't know uh if i'll succeed to uh like manage all of the comprehension of this my uh small ambition at least is to have clear ideas about the specific services and then try to overlay. But it's of course the the the, the trick of science is as well that uh, at some point it could happen that I don't find uh, on big scale fundamental uh, findings, but at least for the individual functions, I'll be able to do so. Okay, yeah. So, any, um, any other question or just uh, give us our thought or any comment on how to proceed in our research or any fact that we haven't considered and it's important? Yeah, I can see Darina Manolova that raised your hand. Uh, yes, you, is... Yeah, you can. Uh, yes, you can. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, we know each other only through mail. Uh, I'm from South Korea. Uh, we, I think we're gonna be discussing <laughs> a lot of things <laughs> in, another, in another time. But what I want to ask you, because now uh, Todor, you were trying to measure or you are trying to figure out the optimal urban density, but um, also time is a variable. Do you have a time frame in your framework? That's actually, that's why, that's a, a good question. I mean, and uh, the way I would like to tackle with this is the following. That's why I made this distinction between density and densification. So uh, I, I like, I would really would like to emphasize that density, it's just like, w if we think about urban density, it, it, it relates to a state of something. So like uh, <laughs> to be as practical as possible, I will look at the time for which I have the data. So let's say in 2019, I, I freeze time and I just see what kind of density has worked and what kind of correlation I can draw. Because of course, uh, the time uh, the time issue is something that will always change. So, so people, uh, let's say, will move to another neighborhood, the population density will be higher there. But then uh, I hope that if, if I draw this correlation between, okay, population density has uh, certain importance in respect to public transport or certain importance with respect to this or that, uh, that I can predict when this change, how the services should change. 
uh, or like should adapt a little bit because that's actually the challenging thing that is happening now in Norway as well in terms of density strategies, the densification strategies, at least to my understanding, is that a lot of knowledge is out there, but still uh, these tweaks that they look at, that we look at simplified aspects of density doesn't allow us to improve or to change services in the best possible way when urban form uh, changes and vice versa. I mean, it's the other way around as well. If we, if we change, because actually the other way around is even more, uh, it's more, it's happening more often because urban services change more than build form. I don't know if I, uh, Yes, you have kind answer. of, kind of. Okay, thank you very much. But it what do you mean in terms of time then? Like, I, I would like to ask you, like, the, the changes, right? Uh, can you unpack a little bit more about this? Yes, uh, okay, you're going to be measuring something, the existing data, trying to, uh, to create a model that can do predictions. But as well, we know that uh, we can never optimize for the next 50 years, although we put agendas for 2050 or 2030, knowing though that during time we can expect another crisis or we can expect, uh, since the, the main point of reference is the human being, <laughs> okay, yeah. and it's the most unpredictable, <laughs> how it can, um, not it, he, she, the human being, can change uh, like requirements um, of, of life and everything. Yes. So we're dealing with a big, big variable. And this is why I was asking whether you have some kind of idea for the future. I think the optimal, yeah, I, I get it a little bit more now, uh, things. Uh, I think the optimal uh, aspect, you can, I can use that only if I just establish certain relationships. Uh, because optimal, the optimal city or the best, the ideal city, I mean, of course, it, it doesn't exist. There will be always uh, uh, problems with this, and it's a tricky word. Uh, I think uh, my point of view is that, okay, I would like to have optimal service uh, arrangement in respect to uh, the built environment. Okay. Uh, and based on that, that we can draw more accurate assumptions about changes in the future. So if we have to reduce, let's say crisis happen, if we have to reduce uh, the amount of money we put in public transport, how we do that? And uh, like uh, which areas will be more vulnerable, let's say, and so on. Okay, so again, again we have a factor of flexibility that should be included in, in the whole model. Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that's actually, yeah. Good point. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna text you. I'm gonna email you other questions because it, please it's do. a big discussion. Yeah. We can make a talk, yeah, please do. Okay, thank you. Bye guys. Uh, all right. Uh, somebody else? I mean ah uh, Harold. Yes. Uh, just go ahead. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the presentations. Uh, I think the last question is very interesting, um, the time factor, and I think you partly uh, replied to it, but I just like to kind of underline it because, uh, you know, these things takes a lot of time, uh, densification, um, as opposed to, say, technology shifts in toothbrushes, computers and cars which happens, you know, big leaps um, very fast within years or a decade or two. <clears throat> so identification is a very slow process and most cities are really messy. So I think the question that came up is, is worth pondering a little more on uh, because with your PhD, it could be useful for you to kind of, um, you know, set uh, maybe a, a target for, you know, what is optimization and a kind of by when, because if, if, you're, if you're trying to optimize densities, you know, as a theoretical concept, um, the, 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 and you're actually going to 
give some tools to people for carrying this out to your work, you know, from learning from it. There's a big difference between if you kind of locate your uh, knowledge and your recommendation for the next five years, or whether you, whether you talk about a long-term process of say, you know, 50 to 100 years. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I think I think the time concept here that the uh, one of the other people here <clears throat> brought in <clears throat> is uh, is is very interesting, at least for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Hanout. Yes, certainly. Uh, maybe we can speak more about it as well. <laughs> uh, but sure. uh, this is this is a good point, of course how to overcome the because things change and even if it's optimal now in respect to public transport certain area like in the future it could not be and yeah. let's see how i can manage to deal with it any other comment from the audience feedback or just uh, go to the discussion questions Okay, yeah, well, let's do that. Uh, okay, guys, so because this is still uh, a workshop, although it's a live workshop, uh, it's more about uh, uh, discussing things. Uh, since you are shy, we'll bring some uh, questions to you. And uh, we'll be very peculiar to hear your answers about it. I mean, you can, you have to see my screen. Uh, I don't know if I should make it big, probably to return me in the front. So, I mean, if you see it well, we have two questions for you that we are very curious to hear. Uh, what do you think about or perspective, whoever feel like it. The first one is uh, the efficiency of which urban service or amenity is from a particular interest for you. And the second one is can you think of any possible effects if multifunctionality of green infrastructure is not considered in the planning processes? I guess negative effects, yeah. Do you want to, yeah. yeah. So can you think of any possible negative effects if multifunctionality of green infrastructure is not considered? Um, Just type uh, your um, answer in the chat or if someone wants to Raise your hand and answer those questions. Oops, I'll get there. Uh -huh. Should we pinpoint people? <laughs> okay. I don't see actually if somebody raises hands. Uh, so Maria, you have to do it now when I'm sharing the screen. I cannot see someone that's raising their hand. So let's give us some minutes if you type the quote, the answer. So we have an answer about the first question. I don't know if you can see it or should I? You please do it because I... Uh... Okay, about the first question, which efficiency of urban service in particular, a political representation of real life condition in decision-making process of city, extreme political parties dominating urban development. Okay. 
Um, do, do you like uh, who, who? I don't know who sent that because I don't see it, but. Uh, Why is the. Do you like to do you like to elaborate on this? Uh, okay. Uh, so we have some problems. So there is a person that is raising their hand. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Luis. Okay. Hey. Hey guys, uh, do you hear me well? Yes. Yes. All right. So, no, I just wanted to uh, give you some points on the second question. So, mm -hmm. one of the negative effects, I would say that is uh, having uh, in infrastructure that is only sort of a thought on one, on, on simple services, right? So, you, you have uh, uh, green areas around, for example, uh, roads that may be used for recreation or for uh, you know other environmental purposes that are not you know uh, used in in their full potential right mm -hmm. so i i would say that's probably the the one of the negative effects of not thinking of a multifunctional infrastructure infrastructure framework thank you very much for the answer. I think it's a good point. Uh, this negative impact. And this, this is for you. I, I mean, Maria is actually looking for international case comparison studies. Uh, so I know that Luis is based in Colombia. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, yeah, we actually we can. We're, well, I work in the in the ministry right now, and we're making the sort of a urban policy. And one of our one of our uh, lines of action, let's say, uh, is is uh, green infrastructure, nature based solutions, and so try to include, uh, try to figure out figure out like a, our legal framework here to to start building up on the, on that, right? Uh, so that actually we can we can uh, maybe some other time. But uh, discuss this much in, more into depth. But uh, sure. Yeah. Um, um, I'm sure, there, there are some interesting cases here. Uh, not they're not a lot built right now, but there are some interesting cases right now. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, I, I have I I can remember one uh, that it's uh, that it's in Barranquilla, you know, a city in the in the north. Uh, they sort of remodeled this, um, um, how do you call it? this? They have, well, they have this particular problem that uh, there are a lot of flash floods right? mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the, of, the set, of the city center, or not city center, but general of the city. Um, and they, so they built this one square, uh, which, which is designed to take in some, uh, some, of, the, some of the water whenever, whenever these flash floods co come, mm -hmm. right? And still function as a as a square. So, so I, mm -hmm. I can think of that one right now. Mm. Uh, so it, it's a bit like uh, like the Bethlehem Plain uh, water square in the, in in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like that uh, with a different approach, but but uh, yeah, it's a bit like that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to contact me from any potential collaboration. Um, we will put our email in the yeah. chat if Sam yeah. has. Yeah. Just someone. No, sorry, yes. it's a uh, noise here. <laughs> right. okay. yeah, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I, can, I can write my email here if you want as well okay. in the chat. I can communicate too, as well. Like I can help with this connection. That's fine. That was true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, we have ah, this was you guys. Mm -hmm. It's in trouble, but whatever the political of a city.
This is actually true. Yeah. Thank you for the point, Theos. I mean, of course. Uh, yeah. I don't. I'm not really sure how uh, I would relate. Like, like, but of course, it could be related to uh, density. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm not sure how we can measure this, but uh, it's a good challenge to look at these things. Uh, and you can like think about the the complexity of time and change in uh, neighborhoods as well. Whether could be connected to any kind of, whether these changes when the type of residents uh, change, probably, uh, but I cannot, uh, of course, claim any with, anything with certainty about that. Uh, okay. So I, I think uh, we don't need to, I don't know Maria, if you want to, Yes. Who is that? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I don't know what was that, but I, I don't uh, I I think we can go uh or you want to okay, we have two more questions guys. At last, but I don't want to stretch it too much. Uh but we also have, if you have any particular response to that, feel free. Uh, okay, so which are the benefits of multifunctional green for green infrastructure in your well, in your opinion? Uh, and what is the most significant challenge to socially accept higher urban density in your own context? If you have some snappy perspective on this, please just raise your hand. Well, uh, you want, yes. want, uh, I can see. So, Luis Eduardo, yes, you can. Yes. Uh, oh, hi, sorry, again. <laughs> um, so, no, I would say, uh, like, again, with the second one, I would say, again, uh, the, 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 to socially accept here, at least in, in Colombia, I think there, there, are two, there are two things, right? So, um, usually in big cities now, uh, there's more and more, like, acceptance on, on high, uh, higher, higher buildings, right? Uh, but then, then there's again, of course, this uh, uh, there's this thing where you, if you, if you, if you live in, in more dense places, then there's this per this perception of insecurity and um, you know other these other things that are some are you know in the on just on an imaginary level, others might be real as well. But, but then if you go out onto lesser populated cities, uh, the, there is a challenge to actually sell uh, houses, or sorry, not houses, but apartments in, 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 in these places, right? Because there, people actually want, like culturally, they actually want uh, to be closer to the floor, <laughs> uh, right? So they would rather prefer a, a house than a, than a building. Uh, and this has become challenging because here we have a bit of uh, the perception that density necessarily means more um, or higher alt altitudes, right? Or bigger, taller buildings. Uh, uh, and that is not necessarily true, like you, like you showed in your presentation, right? There are different uh, urban patterns that you can achieve certain densities uh, by occupying more land, of course, right? Uh, so that's, 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 that's a 
kind of an interesting thing that is happening here. I don't know if it happens uh, there as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thanks for the perspective. I think this is actually uh, something that is uh, very interesting, uh, that it's international. I mean, the, 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 I think the reasons for, uh, like, the challenges are, like, in regards to different topics, more or less, but, uh, but there is always this problem with the perception, actually, and uh, changing. The, the, it's, it's not necessarily about it's not necessarily about quality of services, quality of life, or quality of, uh, uh, or efficiencies. It's really about perception of people, how they want to do it. And I mean, the example of uh, uh, having your own house, uh, like the touch house uh, here in, I guess I, I, I would not like to speak in that so, in, with so much certainty, because I'm not Norwegian, but there is this perception that, uh, uh, denser areas are still not that attractive. However, this changes. I, I, I think it's changing with time. It's a also, it's also, I think it's generation thing. Uh, for example, people before us, our parents and so on, they had this idea, this mindset, at least in the Western world, that uh, kind of, it is attractive to live in your own house, like far away, that is luxurious. I mean, some people still believe that, but of course, for us younger uh, generations, a lot of us actually start thinking in reverse. So it's a, but the challenge is always about perceptions and and preferences. What you consider attractive, what you could consider livable, and what, and that's why I put there that uh, the, the the challenge of understanding perception of density is still there, and I am afraid that I cannot deal with this as well in my work. So I'm really, I will be really happy to work with someone that is focusing on that. That's another PhD at itself. So we have an answer again in your question to Dor. So concerning accepting higher urban densities, the same as in that out in more social and economic possibilities. Yes, okay. So if someone wants to add something we are one minute to 2 30. yeah thank you for this uh, i just want to react thank you for this yours uh yes i mean uh, but then don't you think that it, it has to be like more social and economic possibilities are like going to happen in when it's higher densities or you think the opposite aha okay and then we have a response from andres mm -hmm. i see it now uh, I don't Yeah, okay, exactly. But I think this is a very interesting point that you're bringing up there. Because uh, I think maybe I'm rotating around the same thing, but it gets it, it again uh, relates to perception how people think about these things because uh, there is still not uh, there is still not very strong uh, proof that uh, actually higher denser areas have uh, have affected uh, COVID like cr critically. I mean, and there is something else. I mean, of course, this is if you look at the number of uh, cases uh, measured, of course, if there are more people, most likely there'll be more cases, but also how do you treat this situation? Uh, you can argue that suburban areas are uh, more vulnerable because they cannot respond quick enough. So it's again, very interesting in terms of how do you look at these things? Uh, as they look at it in the past. And Luis, I think, but but yeah, fair point. I mean, of course, it is there, it is happening, uh, and it is something that has to be, of course, considered, because it is actual thing. Yes, yeah, Luis? I, I, wanted, I just wanted to add on that, because I think, uh, from what I've seen, I think there's a, sort of a misunderstanding of the difference between density, overcrowding, and agglomeration, right? Yeah. So, so we we tend to use density as a sort of word, general as a general word for for both of for all of those three things, right? And when you, and when you started or, or what I've seen, right, 
uh, is that uh, actually density is not is not a is not a bad thing uh, because when you when you take for just for example New York right uh, when you check the, the statistic for, for for New York you see that Manhattan or, or the not in Manhattan but uh, Brooklyn the, the most uh, dense areas have have has had a, a lesser impact than the, the than the lesser uh, areas right or that you see that, for example, Singapore, that is much dense than, I don't know, Idaho um, in the US, uh, they, they have less uh, impact, they have been less impacted uh, uh, than, than, yeah, than Idaho or something like that, right? Uh, but of course, then you also have to take into account what measures uh, each government and each city uh, took, right? Uh, but, but I do agree, I think there, there's, there's, there has been this sort of a, uh, poor use of, of the of the of the three different concepts right because overcrowding uh, for example in an informal uh, neighborhood is much is a much more complicated problem than than density and that's probably one of the reasons why uh, you cannot keep social distancing no excellent uh, yeah addition i mean of course I try to tackle it a little bit uh, in my presentation, but maybe of course uh, there is, we, we have to keep reminding ourselves that, that of course there are different things. And uh, if you look at density as a uh, as pure parameter measurement, it's actually neutral. Uh, it doesn't tell us things about uh, this kind of effects. And that's why actually, that's why it's very, I mean, it's not easy to, to, to use the, the concept of density straightforward and that's why it was misused for many, so many years uh, i mean uh, if you look at uh, the us planning and uh, like anglo saxon tradition of planning it it has it has this uh, uh, idea that it has to get us against overcrowding of industrial cities so they kind of for generations they developed this uh, this idea that okay we have to lower densities because they were assuming that density leads to overcrowding and uh, yeah, of course, uh, we have to be very careful with that. We don't have the luxury uh, lu luxury to keep uh, misusing it because of sustainability. Uh, uh -huh, okay, yeah, thank you for that, Jos. Yeah, exactly. No, I got you. Okay, guys, I, I think uh, I would like to thank everyone. I don't know if Maria, if you want to add something. No, uh, I would like also to say thank you for attending. And thank the, you for attending. Yeah. Mm -hmm, and a helpful insight and feedback in our research. I, yeah, the same. And I just would like to let you know that this will be, this uh, session, it's recorded and it will be shared to the university's, uh, the Smart City Research Group YouTube channel. So we'll share it with whoever uh, we know. If not, just uh, if you want to be, to receive that, just send us an email. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Have a nice very much. afternoon, evening. Bye. Bye, thank you.